Thank, yeah, thank you guys so much for having me today. Uh, you know, this is, both my parents were professors here. My mom, uh, actually on, on both ends of Hearst Avenue, my father taught at, uh, at, at Corey Hall there. Um, computer sciences, electrical engineering, and physics, and my mom uh, taught at Tolman Hall, uh, was a psychology professor. So it's always a treat to be here, walk my dogs on the campus uh, every morning. So. It's almost late because of that. Almost late because of that. Um, I, I, you know, today what I thought I would do is I'd, I'd, first of all, tell you a little bit about myself just for a moment, um, and then I'd tell you how I perceive what we do and the advantages of public relations and the importance of communications. And then I thought I'd give you a lot of, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, war stories of things that we've worked on to give you object examples. And then, of course, um, you know, would love to be able to have you ask questions. I will try to. I know participation counts. Uh, I will try to help you on that. Um, but, but first of all, so I grew up in this town. I started as a newspaper reporter, a cub reporter, worked my way up to being a, a, a city desk reporter. Uh, then, uh, then I went to college. Uh, then I went and skip and fast forward. I went to work at, at another newspaper. I was a, a very bad television reporter. Um, as you can see with my complexion, I sort of a ruddy complexion, so I always looked like I was either on fire or I was freezing to death somewhere. Um, I, I came back and I went to work at um, what, what's now the Berkeley Voice and the, the Piedmont or uh, Montclarian and was the managing editor there. And then somebody came to my doorstep who constantly lobbied me. It was a public relations agency uh, principal named Don Solom. And he said, hey, you know, you, you're, you know, you're a very good editor, you're a good writer, you, know, you seem to follow all these political things, you know, you're ever interested in doing public affairs, public relations, um, you know, for, for companies or for political campaigns. And I said, yeah, you know, tell, tell me how it works on the other side of the coin. And he explained it to me and I became really fascinated in it. And, and the first thing he came to me, maybe a couple months later, said, you know, we have an opening. How, how, do, you, how do you feel about, um, you know, the nuclear power industry? And I said, you know, it's one of the, you know, it's one of the rare things. I'm really not interested in the nuclear power industry. I said, you know, if I'm going to leave journalism, I want to go to something that, that interests me. And in. I don't really have an issue with nuclear power, per se, but it's not something I want to give up my career for. And a couple more months went by, and they had a very interesting um, case. And this is how I, I started my career well, I'll tell you another funny story about the very first one, but this is sort of the second thing I worked on. And it was, and this is a really fun uh, piece of business, and this goes on today. There was a class action lawsuit by a woman who'd been wrongly denied uh, the higher level of unemployment benefits somewhere between the 60s and the 70s. Her name was Betty Ann Boren. And she sued, and it became a class action lawsuit, to get the same amount of uh, unemployment pay that men got. And it was a discrimination case, essentially. I went up to the California Supreme Court, and, uh, and she won. So then there was a pile of, I can't remember how many, you know, call it $100 million, that could be distributed back to women who had been wrongly given, a sh you know, shorted, essentially, during that 67 to 70 some odd period for unemployment. And so my job was to take her and her attorney um, tell that story and say to women out there, the, 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 the group, that there was money available to them that they could get, but they needed to apply, you know, for it. They had to, and this is, by the way, you know, this is, this is the middle of the 80s, and, and since you're all, you know, youngsters, you know, their, their fax machines were fairly new. Um, so it was an absolutely amazing thing to put a piece of paper in this thing and have it show up somewhere else. So almost everything was done by mail, uh, by phone, and if you had a client with real cash, by hand delivery, and you could hand something, you know, overnighted somewhere. Um, FedEx was still relatively new then. So, you know, I just called, I first, the very first thing you have to do, and this is really true of every public relations assignment is, you know, there, there's sort of old saying about uh, um, computers and computer programming and just data, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Unless you create a really good contact list, you know, a good mail list, a good email list, a good phone list, um, at the very beginning, you know, and you've targeted the people that you want to reach, you're going to constantly be batting your head up against the wall. And it's the real, there are very few things in life that are real strokes of genius or where you get really lucky. Almost all the things we wind up being super successful are doing, the, uh, ironically, are doing the very simple things better than anybody else, which means creating a really great list. So 
my first job was sort of figuring out that list. You know, who am I? Who am I? Who's going to be interested in in these stories? So in those days, there were, there were and they no longer exist now. They become the uh, lifestyle pages, but they were called women's pages. Uh, still old fashioned, even in the eighties. Uh, so remaining women's uh, pages, sort of editors, um, city desk, because I felt this would be a good city side news story. That the, you know, if there would be somebody who's a news side person who'd be interested in it. Um, and then I went for you know some business writers and people who had public affairs programs, and I sent the news release out to them and said you know this is what the settlement is, and then I followed up and I said hey you know I have the lady who won this multi you know million dollar judgment and I have her attorney and we'd love to be able to book him because it's a compelling story about a lady who felt that she was shorted, stood up for her rights, all of other people joined this and she wound up um, getting you know hundred some odd million dollars to people who who were shorted. And boom, you know, we just started booking her. And she was very nice, down to earth. I can't remember what she did for a living now, it's so many years later. Um, but she just was a regular kind of worker bee, hardworking, didn't want to be shorted. So she was a great story. She's sort of the perfect news story. You know, she, she wasn't, you know, a Hollywood type. She was a real person. She felt she'd been shorted and that everybody else ought to get the same. They're equal pay for equal work, men and women. So people ate this story up and we got, you know, I think we distributed the vast majority of that money that was set aside in that legal judgment form. So that's my, my little quick story about the first thing that I worked on. Now, actually, the second thing. The very first thing I will tell you was, first day I ever started in public relations, I came in, I had to fill in for somebody else who had left to go to another agency. And you will have this in, in your careers where you, you, all of a sudden you get thrown into something, and you don't really know what you're doing, but you're, you're trying to carry it off as best you can, look professional, and do the right thing. So my, my job was to take this news release that had been sent out saying that there was a major printing plant that had, been, that had opened up by a very big company, I believe the name of it was George, somewhere in Walnut Creek or Concord. And uh, I just needed to go and cover this press event. So I, I go to the press event, I have extra copies of the, the press release. I, I show up early and I put signs up saying, you know, this way to press conference. And, and then I walk in the door and it's, it's a room not unlike this. And there was probably half as many people there and there was a giant Xerox machine in the middle of this room. And I thought, man, really, it's, it's like, this is a premium. So I, I, I don't want to look like I'm an idiot. I don't want to blow my agency's cover here. And I was, so I say to the gentleman in charge, I said, geez, you know, so this is the new printing press. Oh, yeah, this is the, this is the latest in technology. And, but it's like, as he's telling this to me, I realize, you know, this is really a Xerox machine. And I'm looking closely at the news release that's been written by somebody else. So I, you know, this isn't a very sexy story. This is actually kind of horribly dull. So I'm getting in my mind that this could go south, that nobody in the news media who's read this news release is going to show up for this because it just is not compelling. And why would you show up at essentially the opening of a, of a printing press? Well, uh, to, to, to skip ahead to the story, my, my fears were confirmed. But before I get to what happens, there's a, there's a giant table, and, they're ex and there's a huge number of chairs. They're expecting, like, I don't know who the guy was who had my job before me, but he had oversold to them that everybody in the world was going to show up to see their printing press. And uh, it was, you know, bringing business to uh, Contra Costa County, and it was going to employ, you know, 12 people. So there was, like, chairs for 20, 25 people. There was a coffee urn. There was a coffee urn that was this big, and there was donuts for 200 people. So I sit down, and the press conference was start at 11. You know, I've gotten there early. Um, you know, so it's like half hour goes by. It's like 11, and the guy I'm sitting next to is like looking at his watch. Nobody's shown up. It's to be 11:10. He's getting a little, you know, getting a little, little antsy. Gets to be like 11:20, and he, I could see he's getting like really angry. And he just turns to me and he says, "No one's coming, are they?" And I said, uh, "No, no, sir. Uh, I, 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 I don't think anybody's coming." And he says, "Well, what do you in your agency propose to, to do about this?" And I said, "Well." You know, I'm going to go back and speak to my boss, uh, Olive Lewis, um, and I suspect that she will suggest that we write. And as soon as I heard the word write, he goes, write, 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 that's all you people do. Um, he says, you write news, news, you're this, but you know, we haven't gotten a single news story. And I said, God, you know, I'm really sorry, you know, I, but let me go back, I'll speak to Olive Lewis. And I started to leave and I, and I made a fatal error. I'm walking by the donuts and I said, would you, would you mind if I have a donut? And he goes, you want a donut? And he just, just picked this donut up and he says, and I really looked really angry, he started fucking throwing donuts at me. <laughs> Um, and luckily I didn't ask for a cup of coffee. Uh, so I go running out, donuts flying past me, um, and, I, and I go back and I, uh, that's my very first experience. So I don't want any of you, and you may all have first days like that, maybe worse than that. Don't be discouraged. 
Um, I didn't know what I was doing. The guy before me didn't know what I was doing. Um, there was no reason to, to have a press conference for a printing press. Um, so that should be a, a lesson that I hope you can all carry away from today, unless it's a giant friggin' uh, printing press. Um, what do guys in public relations do? You know, what, 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 what's our goal and what, what's my goal? And think my goal, and I think this what makes this really a fun profession for me, is essentially I am a journalist. Uh, I do the exact same things that a journalist does. I write and try to write exactly in the same style as journalists do, Associated Press style. Um, I try to think like journalists do, um, but I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate for a client and their point of view. Um, but even being an advocate for a client point of view, you have to understand the people who might oppose you or on the other side of you, who don't think the way that you do, and you have to anticipate their criticisms, your point of view, and try to inoculate your client uh, against them. Or at least be able to say, look, other, other people will say the following, but here's, here's what the facts are. So I'm essentially a, 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 a journalist for hire. Um, secondly, and, and, and I think equally important, is uh, I'm a storyteller. Uh, and I think the ability to tell stories now more than ever before in history, even though there are many, many, many great storytellers, great writers, great authors, um, great speechwriters who've come before us in the course of time, um, now is the most important time in history to be able to tell a story because anybody with a computer can be Gutenberg and publish their own Bible. Anybody who wants to be a journalist can be a journalist. Any corporation that wants to tell their story, any special interest cause, any political party, all they have to do is own a computer and, and be thoughtful, a good storyteller, not over the top, and they can build an audience for what they believe in, and that is something that is radically different and impossible in the course of time uh, until now. And you know, it's created uh, a problem for, for traditional journalism because now there's a lot of competition. Anybody with a computer can, can do this. But the people who are successful at this are people who are good storytellers. They, they know how to organize their thoughts. Um, they know how to make it compelling. You know, I used to, when I would start off as a cub reporter and I, I'd write, you know, start when there were still typewriters, um, and I'd write it and I'd hand it, you know, to the guy in front of me who was a city editor, and he'd look at it and he goes, Jesus, you know, really, is this like the dullest lead in the world? And he says, who the hell is going to read this story? He says, and he'd scratch that up and he'd get another piece of paper and he'd, uh, as he would term it, he'd jazz the lead up, you know, he would make it just much more interesting, more compelling. And chances are, most of the time, when you're looking at what you write, you know, the thing that you have to do, or when you're looking at how you're gonna tell a story to somebody, the thing that you have to do is figure out and look at it objectively. It's like, you know, who the hell else is really gonna be interested in this? You know, is it, is it compelling? Would I, would, I, would I read that story? A lot of times there are people who work for us who are fabulous, you know, I'm former head of the San Francisco Chronicle business department, uh, business uh, editor, the, the former executive editor of Contra Costa Times, the uh, former uh, general uh, assignment reporter, crime reporter for the San Francisco Examiner, former uh, Memphis Commercial Appeal uh, uh, City Hall reporter. And they're all very, very good writers. And some of the other folks are also come out of politics and they're good writers for their elected leaders or regulatory agencies that they work for. But it's like, we all get caught up sometime in just trying to write the story and get it organized right without thinking about why would somebody else read it? And a lot of times you just have to stop yourself and think about what, what really is of interest in this thing. Um, and not every story is interesting, so you gotta think about what, what, what does make it interesting. It was funny, and I, and I will tell just a, a side story about this. A young lady who works for us, very good writer, used to be chief paralegal at uh, Joe Kachet's law firm. And she wrote in a news advisory. You guys know what news advisories are? No, let me tell you, let me tell you, I'm gonna break the world down into two things that, I, that, that our agency does. I mean, news advisory and a, and a news release. There's a whole bunch of other tools, but news advisory essentially says, it's got a headline, it's got a contact name and number, and it says, you know, time, date, uh, place, uh, what, and who. And so essentially the headline in this story was about a brand new, it was about a groundbreaking for a brand new building that Mayor of San Francisco is going to be at. Um, and, and it's an important building, and it has an important uh, tenant, Splunk, which is a technology company. But I looked at this thing and I thought, God, you know, when this arrives on somebody's desk, it's like, you know, all right, the mayor's going to be there. It's Splunk. You know, nobody really knows what Splunk is, but um, some people have an idea of what it is. Um, I wouldn't, I was no, there's no fucking way. Um, I would show up to this thing. It just, it is not interesting. So I, I went back to her, I said, you know, sh show me, the, show me the, the data on the building that they're building. 
And, uh, and I looked at it, and one of the key things about this building was that there was like four parking places in a, in a 300,000 square foot building for cars, and there was 54 parking spaces for bicycles. So it was the, and, and, and the architects, they believed that this was the largest bicycle parking in, San, you know, creation of a new building in San Francisco. So it's like, hey, hey, there's our lead here. It's about the bike. It's like, so the story became, you know, la you know largest bicycle parking um, or largest building created with bicycle, specifically with bicycle parking um, in history of San Francisco. I tell you, everybody showed up for that. Everybody showed up for that. Now, did, they, did it wind up being like big, long, in-depth stories? No, but it wound up being a story about bicycle parking and the growth of bicycles in San Francisco, so much so that people who were building multi-million dollar buildings were creating more spaces for bicycles than they were for cars. So it's that little juxtaposition sometimes when you're looking at things that makes a big difference because it makes it more interesting, it's unusual, it's the, it's the thing that makes it, um, as they say in advertising, it's the unique selling proposition. It's the thing that makes it stand out it makes it very different from anything else. So, uh, so what, you know, what, what do we do? We're, we're journalists who happen to be advocates. Um, we're storytellers. Uh, and we try to make things compelling and interesting and get people interested in them. Now, most of the time people think of, of public relations agencies as promoting uh, products, you know, the, the newest printer from HP, or they think about it, you know, uh, uh, you know new, new widgets. Uh, new cars, um, new technology, new apps, or, or services. They're promoting um, attorneys or, or plastic surgeons or you know, other type of uh, uh, CPAs. There are agencies that specialize in, in promoting the services of, of uh, certified public accountants. Now, to me, I, and I'm completely fascinated with what the folks do who do product publicity and service publicity, because it's, 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 it's not what we do. But I'm fascinated by the techniques. I'm fascinated by the thinking. Um, and, and, but it's really different. There's an, another kind of branch of public relations that we specialize in. Um, and, and of course, probably from from, from reading <laughs> reading the story about me, um, you know, you'll, you'll see that we get involved in a lot of crises. And you know, and, and we're very good at them. And you know, what makes you good at that? I'll, I'll talk about it later on. You can ask me. But. Um, Probably the number one thing is, is keeping your cool under pressure, you know, and not not freaking out because your clients many times are are really in distress. They're deeply concerned. It's something that's tremendously of importance to them, and they need to have somebody. Just like people need to have a a psychologist um, to go talk to to say, look, these are what my issues are. Can you help me see my way? Um, through this difficult or dark period. Well, the same is true in business. Um, in, in corporations, in mom and pop shops, something goes wrong. Somebody, something, somebody gets electrocuted. Uh, their plant explodes. Um, they poison the burgers like a jack in the box. We work for them, not not on purpose, obviously, but you know, E. coli winds up being a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Um, and they need to have somebody help them figure out what's going to get them out of that terrible place because they feel like their life and their business and their money and their customers and their staff are all collapsing. Um, so that's crisis communications and it's fixing those. Bless you. The other thing that we really do that I really like and is, in, in fact is the um, backbone of our financial success uh, is what, what I call public affairs, um, the public affairs business. And essentially it's managing long-term public communications outreach programs. Like we work for the Transbay Terminal. Um, it's the, the, the largest, uh, it's a $3 billion development it will become, and actually when we first came forward, people weren't quite sure what it was 11, 12 years ago. And it's like, well, it's, it's going to be where high-speed rail comes through, it's going to be where buses come through, it'll be where Caltrain comes to. And it's like, hey, we're sitting around, you know, it's this Grand Central Station. So this, is the Grand, this is Grand Central Station. Anybody, I, this is my hometown, but I love New York. So I said, this is Grand Central Station of the West. And that name has absolutely stuck. It's the thing that made journalists understand it. It's the thing that made elected leaders understand it better. And it's the thing that got real public acceptance for it, is that one descriptive phrase. Uh, and so many times, uh, not to get off my, my track here of talking about public affairs, but one time, many times, just thinking of something that's similar, bless you, um, that 
that is descriptive, that makes people understand something that's new, even though it's not exactly the same thing, is the thing that will carry the day. Because what journalists are looking for, what the public is looking for, what elected leaders are looking for, what consumers are looking for, is something that they can easily understand and fit into a box real quickly. Now, you can look at that and be real critical. It's like, geez, are you, are you dumbing it down? Are you making it too simple? And, and I would argue the opposite. It's like, I'm getting somebody's attention on something that they might not understand, and if I explain the whole darn thing to them, they'd be probably turned off in the first couple seconds. My job is to make it instantly understandable and get them inside and make them drill down to read the rest of my story, our client's story. Um, you're trying to get their attention. You know, it's, it's, it's the teaser. I was listening to KCBS this morning and I, was, I loved it. Somebody, one of the teasers was, you know, find out how, um, how, how you can help design, you know, your own commuter train. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm, you know, or, or have an impact on, on how you, you know, get on your commuter train in the morning. So I immediately, commuter train, um, must have been somebody who was born in the East. But I'm, I know they're talking about BART. Um, and it's like, oh, no, I'm waiting, for, I'm waiting for that story to come around because I want to hear, you know, how do I get to participate in it? You know, as opposed to somebody sort of saying, you know, BART's going to allow, um, BART's going to allow its passengers to design its trains. Uh, you know, we'll tell you more in five minutes. It's an okay tease. It works. But the other one was more inventive, and it got me more into it. It made me want to wait past the commercial break to, to listen to that thing. So nothing, nothing, like a, nothing like a good little snippet, a little tease to get you involved. But so what's public affairs? I'll get, I'll get back on my own track here. Public affairs is these large communications programs, Transbay Terminal. Um, another one would be uh, Recology. Um, here, in, here in Berkeley, we have our own garbage company, which is passably acceptable. Um, the, world, the world's largest one, or at least one of the largest in the United States, is waste management, also passably acceptable. Um, they're terrible bullies if you watch what happened in Oakland. Um, but we work for Ecology. It's a wonderful company. Ecology was the first company in the United States, and San Francisco was the first city in the United States, to do wholesale recycling of food waste. Just what you're looking at over here. You know, bottles and cans, you got landfill, and you got paper. Now, what you're missing over there is the, is the green can, which we don't do in Berkeley, and is really, is really a shame. Um, but we do in San Francisco. And, and other places in the world are taking up after this. And that is, now, do you have this at home in, your, in, in dorms and apartments? Are you recycling your food scraps? All right, good. All right, good. Composting, good, you're composting. It's a fabulous thing. But let me tell you something. When this started, and this only started composting, serious composting in San Francisco 10, 12 years ago, it was a huge backlash. You know, the... The city wanted it, our client, Recology, wanted it. But, you know, a lot of people, it's like, I don't, I don't want to have food scraps in my house. You know, it, it brings ants, you know, there's roaches, it smells badly. Um, and, you know, whenever you do anything in San Francisco or any major city, you're also talking about a variety of different languages. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about having Chinese, um, Tagalog, um, you know, Spanish, English and trying to get people to save food in their house to then ultimately go compost was a little difficult at the beginning. But you know, we started telling these, these stories about you know, the, the, you know, the, the new bin. You know, there's, you know, you get three bins now. You, know, you get one for, for, for paper and, uh, um, and cans, and it's all a little different. But paper and cans, you get another one that's for garbage, it's your black bin, and you get this new green bin. And I can't tell you, because I mean, you're all uh, you know, extreme youngsters compared to me, how difficult it is to start doing something like that, and I suspect how difficult it will be to do outside of the Bay Area, but uh, it's starting everywhere else. Other, other countries, other nations are uh, very interested in it. Um, but you, you start to, to look at things like that and try to figure out, you know, how, how do you convince somebody to essentially save stuff that they used to put down in the garbage disposal or they, they threw away and went in the landfill? Um, it's a little bit easier in San Francisco, but even San Francisco was a hard sell. Plus, you have to think, most people in San Francisco live in apartments. So now they've, they've had two garbage cans, or maybe just one garbage can, and now you're giving them three. So it becomes a space issue, too. So a lot of these things in long-term communications programs is trying to figure out what are all the complaints against you going to be, and how are you going to answer them, and how are you going to convince people that it's not such a big problem. Um, and I can tell you this, because I think this is the most interesting thing that, that comes out of, uh, of what we do, is the actual research that goes into this stuff. It's not like we guess at everything we do. A lot of times we do. And, and, and over the course of time in your lives, you will guess. And you will make decisions based upon your 
uh, gut judgment on something. So, well, I think they ought to do it this way because this is what my experience has been. And probably nine out of 10 times you'll be right. But what's really fascinating is when you test your gut experience, because a lot of times you learn stuff when you go do research and you do polling. And one of the things that we found after doing this for, for 10 plus years um, and convincing people that composting was the right thing to do was it, 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 when, when people rank what they can do to make the planet a better place, recycling is the number one thing that they feel strongly about and are really wedded to is, is both the recycling portion of this as well as the composting. Um, in, in San Francisco, obviously, composting is part of that, but this is a, a national poll. People really feel like they can have an impact, and I think that's really important. And, you know, I, I hope that as, you know, as cars move more toward, um, you know, electrical or compressed natural gas, uh, or other forms of alternate energies that you know people have that same feeling about reducing global uh, warming and greenhouse gases, but because the cars are the, lo the largest, I believe if I'm correct, the largest contributor to that, that they'll look at driving alternative energy cars in the same way they're looking at recycling. It's something they can genuinely do to have an impact on making the world a better place. Um, but so, these, so, so let me just take a break there for a moment because I, I will regale you with other stories of, uh, of tigers that are loose in zoos and uh, uh, people who are brain dead and uh, attorneys that claim otherwise. Any questions anybody have? Is this helpful to you? I mean, I, I, when I was a student, I, was, you know, I actually wanted to get something out of this crap. Sometimes lectures were good, sometimes they were bad. You, know, you never knew. Um, no questions for the moment. All right. So, oh, please. Uh, I'm just kind of interested on like, how you handle say you were working with a client and you don't really like ethically feel like they like you support what they're doing how do you like handle that personally you know i've never you know i've never, it's a good question and and people ask it to public relations people i think all the time i've never had that experience i've never had a client come and say i want you to do something that was unethical okay. what typically happens is they want to do something that's not in their best interest and to be terribly impolite something that's stupid um, and your job is to convince them not to do something that's stupid that's going to hurt them and backfire. And a lot of times, you know, clients will have, they will have interesting ideas. But when you think them through, and, and they wind up backfiring or boomeranging. And one of the most important things that you can learn, did any of you guys study philosophy here? Anybody read Plato, Socrates? All right, good, good, good. So my favorite thing, I was, I was a philosophy major undergraduate, so... Um, uh, one of the things that I really liked was the Socratic method of, of and, and when you think about that, and it's worth all kind of looking up and studying the Socratic method, it's really asking and drawing out of the person who's making a suggestion the process. You know, well, what do you think would happen next? And, how do you, and because by the time you have them think it through, I don't know what my batting average is here. I'm going to call it eight out of ten times, they'll go, God, you know, that's a really great idea, but boy, could that backfire. You know, boy, it could really go wrong, or boy, that's really difficult, or boy, that's not the, that's not going to cover what I really want to happen. So, one of the most important things you can do is you, is you this is the thing, it's like the big, giant, shocking thing that I will tell you. When you're sitting at the table, and you're a young professional, and you're outside of this university, uh, and you get your first job, you will be sitting there, and you will, you will be thinking, I do not know what the fuck is going on here. Uh, I have no idea what they're talking about, um, and I'm not sure where they're going. All you have to do is two things. One, look really confident. Like, you know what the hell you're doing. That's number one. Um, number two, ask questions. Ask them, well, what would happen if, you know, just ask them all the what would happen if questions. And by the time you've asked them the what the happen if questions are and you've looked confident at this, you will look like a genius because chances are none of them know any more than you do at that table. Not one of them. Not the CEO, not the chief financial officer, not any one of them. They're counting on, on somebody else to help them through that problem. And the best thing that you can do is to help them think through it. You don't have to have the answer. I Numerous times I do not have the answer. And I get the answer uh, out of my own client. And because they're always going to know more than I do, they just need somebody to pull it out of them. And I, I, don't, I don't come to the table with, with the answers. They have it in them. I, my job is to just, you know, you know draw, the, draw the genius out of them. Um, and that's, 
that's the secret, you know. And it's funny because we've got old young folks like you, and they're the working force of the agency. And I can see them when they're sitting at the, you know, when they first join the agency, and they're a little tense, um, sitting with the clients. And you know, I tell them the same advice: as you, look confident, you know, smile at them, look them in the eyes, shake their hands, listen carefully, and ask them questions. And you and you will, you will rule the day over the course of your career. Um, and as, as over the course of your career too, you, you will become truly confident rather than just looking confident. Um, and you'll be able to dole out information based upon your life experience. I mean, you know, it really, it, it, takes, it takes a lot to get gray hair. Um, and, it, and it comes from making tremendous mistakes over the course of your career. But the way you really learn is by making mistakes or seeing, hopefully, somebody else make a mistake and you profit from watching it and saying, God, that really turned out badly. You know, I'll never do that. Um, so that's, you know, one of the, the, the goals in this thing. But, you know, to, to back to that, that general question, it's like and nobody's ever asked us to do anything unethical. You know, we're very, we're selective about picking our clients. Um, you know, I love them all. They're, not all. they're not all perfect. Everybody makes mistakes just like human beings. But just when they make mistakes, you know, it doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. It means you fix the, the mistake and then and you go back to being a, you know, productive corporation, a productive citizen. CEO or you know whatever they were allegedly indicted for, <laughs> but was completely wrong and untrue. So on that same note, um, Jeanette, can you believe I can't remember her name after having said it so many times? McGregor. Jahai McMath. Jahai McMath. All right. So what would you like to know about Jahai McMath? Uh, so do you guys know who Jahai McMath is? Does anyone here know who she is? Yeah, it was a couple of years before they were here at school. So, but um, the story behind it, but also curious on Jenna's thing as far as. When you first were approached with that story, wow. right, that's intense. And, oh, yeah. and you're taken on the side of the hospital against a girl who's in a coma. Yeah, let me, let me tell you, this, this is a very sad, but also a very unusual story. A uh, young 13-year-old girl goes into Children's Hospital, Oakland. Uh, this is like last November. It was actually it was only, it was only, wasn't even a year ago. It seems like kidding, it was. Really? No, it's actually in the news today, but I'll, I'll tell you about that too. Okay. Yeah. It's just another crazy twist in this thing, but. The young lady goes in the hospital um, for um, a variety of surgeries, and uh, she she dies, um, and and is brain and she's brain dead. You know, she's never coming back. But her family um, believes um, somehow that she can be resuscitated, or that she's really just in a coma. And there's a big difference, by the way, between if you go look it up, between a coma and brain death. You know, a coma you can come out of. Brain dead is the same thing as being dead dead. But they wound up getting an attorney, a very aggressive attorney, uh, named Chris Dole in San Francisco. And he started trying to sell the story to the public and the press that, you know, this young lady was alive. They merely, you know, mistreated her and, you know, given the right circumstances, that they should keep her on this uh, artificial support, um, which essentially kept her lungs breathing and by putting fluids into her, kept her organs partially working, although they were deteriorating. Um, Can I pop please, please, please. And before you got in, sort of during that mm. period, the, the storyline was she went in for a tonsillectomy. She just it was right. she just went in to get her tonsils out. The simplest thing. Well, thank, ever. thank you. So the, thank you actually for reminding me about that. So so the, the hospital's getting crushed because it's like 13 year old girl goes into a pediatric hospital, men for Children's Hospital of Oakland, 100 plus years, in, and they killed her. You know, on a simple tonsil. How horrible is this hospital? It's like whoa. You know, so I I, I show up at this thing. And I go and I meet with all the physicians, and, we, and they walk me through all of this. And they're getting vilified in the news media. I mean, what's, what's worse than having your young daughter go in for a simple, simple operation and then have her, have her be you know, killed by the doctors? Well, completely different story. Um, so you know, my job then is to go out and just say, hey, look, you know, this, is a, this is a real tragedy. Um, and there's a young lady who's died here. But there are HIPAA rules, there are federal you know, rules that prevent this hospital from discussing what actually happened. This was not, as the family and their attorney made it out to be, a simple surgery. I can't tell you what, what that surgery is because I'm prevented by law and the hospital is. But you need to know it's not what they're telling you. So my first thing was to cast doubt on their story. So I let the news media know that. The next thing was to explain the tragedy of of death, and that there is no coming back from death. You know, despite Lazarus um, and the story in the Bible, always a good story, but who knows? Um, death is death, 
and there's nothing that will bring you back, sadly. And trying to explain that in a heartfelt, honest way, and at the same time attack, um, not the family, because, you know, the grieving family. They're, they're, you know, I have the deepest respect for anybody who lost their child. There's nothing worse that could happen to you in, in, in your life. Um, but to not let this guy who's a total charlatan, a complete liar, a fraud, um, a carnival clown, besmirch the good name of a hospital that's been around for 100 plus years. And so I went right after Dolan um, and, and, and just, you know, I challenged him, I hit him hard um, everywhere along. I, I, I try not to call him names, although I, I can, I'm, 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 half, I'm, half, I'm half Irish Catholic, so I get kind of pissed off real easily. Um, so, I, so I went right after him, um, you know, whenever I could. And, um, and by the time that was through, and this I really was telling, there was a, a reader's poll. Now, it's not a scientific poll. In the uh, Contra Costa Times, Oakland Tribune, Bay Area Newspaper Group. And it said, you know, who do you, it was a very simple question. Who do you believe in the Jai McMath case, the hospital or the family? 84% of the people believe the hospital. That's hands down, you, don't, you know, that's a landslide. And I had to tell you, I unfortunately don't have the same data from beforehand, but I would tell you it probably was the other way around. And I think we just made a substantial you know, progress in helping tell that story. Now, interestingly enough, the same clown of an attorney just this week, Chris Dolan, and it's in the news, it's, you know, P Pix did it, actually, I spoke to uh, Lisa Fernandez at uh, NBC11 last night, um, Joe Vasquez at 5, Matir and Ross, uh, David DeBolt at the Oakland Tribune, they all did stories today because this guy is trying to, uh, uh, the attorney, is trying to file something um, in court saying that they should overturn the, uh, the brain death designation um, because she's actually alive. Now, they, they have her in, at some nutcase hospital um, back in New Jersey uh, on artificial support where they put stuff in her body, but she's deteriorating. Um, she's just deteriorating in a slower amount than one would normally because they're shooting her full of juice and pumping her air in her lungs. So he's a really sad, weird guy. And, um, and you know, just like in Watergate, if you guys go back and, and uh, you know, read the famous line of Deep Throat, it's like, follow the money. Whenever you're looking at something, I hate to say it, follow the money. Think about what, what, if it's not about money, it's about what's in it for somebody. Why are they doing something? Well, in this case, uh, Chris Dolan is a proponent of yes on 46. I encourage you all to vote no on 46. I hope you're all registered. Um, and, and, and 46, if it was approved, would uh, lift the uh, limit on malpractice um, pain and suffering from $250,000, which is what it is now, to $1.25 million. Um, and so, you know, I, when I look at this, I see this is all is really about a battle for what he'd like to have happen um, at a statewide level. And I think it's cynical, I think it's horrible, I think he's a bad guy. And that's the other thing you will see as time goes by in, you, as you, in your career. You know, you will see a lot of people who look like they are well-meaning, who are telling you these stories, and they seem so heartfelt. Again, always ask, where's the money coming from? But also realize that there are people who are genuinely, they look good, but they are truly evil. And there are a lot of really bad people. I mean, there are a lot of really bad people out there. It is my belief that the vast majority of people are really good people. But there are people who are manipulative, they're bad, and they try to tear down things that are really good. And they get more power and more money out of stopping things when the rest of the world wants to make good things happen. So that's my, my two cents on evil people. Watch out for them. Yes? So you said you go after him in the media. How do you do that? Like how do you challenge? Could you give us the ah. Well, you know, I, I, I would sort of say, you know, first of all, is, you know, I, I, there's three rules of journalism that they taught us in, in graduate school at, uh, at Medill School of Journalism, a fine uh, journalism school at Northwestern. It was clear, concise, and correct. Those are the three C's. So I'm going to pass on the clear and concise here and go straight to correct. Every time this guy said something, I go check with the physicians about, well, you know, is that, is that possible? Is that, is, that, is that medically, is that correct? And they go, no, it's, it's a horse shit. You know, it's a lie. That's absolutely 100% wrong. And so the, the physicians don't, I mean, think about it also. So why, do they, why does a hospital use a, an external public relations agency and a guy who's kind of a known fighter to go tell their story? Well, when you think about your doctors, you want, you, you want a doctor who's, Pointed, who's maybe a little angry, a little red in the face. Um, do you want somebody who's attacking somebody else? No. You want a doctor who's like Marcus Welby, MD. You want somebody who's like sweet, kind, you know, country physician, warm, friendly. 
So there's a real reason, just, just like you know, they cast people in movies, there's a reason corporations cast people in roles, why they come to an outside person to do this. You know, I have a real theory about, you know, look, look at, look at I, I love, um, you see the more, unfortunately, on TV is presidential press conferences, uh, and you don't see enough of them. But I always think of this as the US Senate model, um, but it's also the presidential press secretary model. The role of a CEO, or the role of the president is to deliver visionary, big picture news and to talk about accomplishments. And, and, and that, that's their role, and that should be the role of the person who's the leader. The role of the press secretary is to take the barbs, to catch the arrows, to deal with the negativity. So that you don't have the, the president or a CEO in the same position out there having to take really difficult questions all the time. Now there's certain, there are many uh, uh, exceptions to that rule, but as a general rule of thumb, you want to put the person in charge out with positive, heartfelt, warm, good, visionary messaging, and you want to have the public relations person, the press secretary, be the person who's delivering the, the hard stuff. So I, I went straight after him. So, you know, what Mr. Dolan told you is 100% incorrect. Here's what it is. And you know, I'm, while I'm from Berkeley, you know, I, I, uh, they call Missouri the show me state. Well, the same is true now more than ever. It's like, it's like show me. When I would make a statement, I'd say, here it is, right out of uh, DSM, you know, Diagnostic Systems Manual, one, two, or three, wherever the thing was. Here it is in the medical things, and I hand it out to him off camera and say, look, so that's what, like, so Mr. what Mr. Dolan told you was 100% incorrect and frankly was an out and out lie. So it's like, whoa. And you know what? Nobody loves the news media. Nobody loves a battle more than the news media. And particularly television uh, reporters, because it's so unbelievably visual. Um, and th the other thing that's actually sort of interesting about the Jahai McMath case is there is a there's something about the Christmas time curse. In in, in if you're if you're if you're working for clients, when something happens during the holidays, almost everybody else it's look it's December. Almost everybody takes December off. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It's like everything shuts down. Universities shut down. People go home for Christmas. People go home for Hanukkah. People go home for whatever. The same is true of everybody else. So when something happens over, over Christmas time, when the news media mostly does stories about holiday season stories, you know, some poor person who's been rescued, somebody they got at the rescue shelter, you know, some dog, some cat, some whale, um, you know, it's struggling and it's making it through during the holiday season, thanks to, you know, the good thoughts of, you know, the local community. Uh, they're doing stories about the latest in technology, all the presents. Well, all of a sudden you get something that's a real genuine news story. People, it's like, shit, this is interesting. You know, it's the only thing we got going. Otherwise, it's all present stories. And, you know, they don't like to cover present stories and all that feely good stuff, you know, over the whole, for the whole month. It's too long. It gets too, it's like, it's like a sugary donut filled with jelly. They want some real news. So when you are the person, the unfortunate person, like our clients many times, and something happens to you and it's a crisis in December, what's normally a minor news story all of a sudden gets propelled to be the biggest story in the world. And that's what happened with Jai McMath. This was everywhere, you know, um, in December. It was the story, I mean, I spent, I worked every single day in, in December, Christmas Day, my birthday, two days before Christmas, for those of you who want to remember me at some point. Um, that would be the 23rd, for those of you who can't count. Uh, I worked on, I worked on, I worked on uh, uh, you know, New Year's Day. Every single day I was out there. And every time they held a press conference, I held a press conference. I tried to beat them to it. I'd hold a press conference with new news before them. And finally, they, you know, they, we, we said, fine, if, if, you know, she's deceased, the coroner's issued the, the death certificate. If you really want to take her body and believe otherwise, you know, we just wanted to, to uh, you know, get the tragedy off our doorstep, and it really was a tragedy. Yes. In cases that are personal like that, how do you uh, like defend your client without defending family's decision? I attack the attorney. You know, I never. I just. I didn't. You know, they. They really. I'll be very honest. They handed. They handed me an easy club to beat them with. I mean, they. They gave me the club. They got a short, grumpy, um, ill-mannered attorney. Um, and if they really had been smart, they would have made it much harder for the hospital, they would have made it much harder for me, and they would have solely used the family, because it's almost impossible to attack that family. And, I, and you know, and I, I certainly wouldn't have done it, nobody at the hospital would have done it, because it just, you, you, can't, you can't grieve enough for somebody who's lost their child, it just, it's impossible. But, you know, that's what you gotta look out for. Just like, you know, I was looking earlier and I gave you the, the, the sort of the tail of the, the bi most bicycles, you know, in a, in a, it's what's the thing that's unusual or, or different that you can glom onto 
and use to your advantage. It's a constant game of jujitsu. How do you take somebody else's strength and beat them with it? And that's you know that's the the crisis business that we're in. Let me tell you another I'll tell you another sort of Christmas time uh, Christmas time catastrophe, which is people always love the story. I hope you do too. So Christmas, Christmas time, everybody goes home, everybody's happy. Um, Christmas Day, now six years ago, um, San Francisco Zoo, tiger gets out of a cage, mauls one young man to death, and it leaves the mark of Cain on another, and uh, is finally taken down by a uh, San Francisco Police Department sharpshooter as it hovered over you know, the, 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 the third one. Boom, tiger's dead. Wow, big giant story in the newspaper. This is Christmas Day, by the way, so day after Christmas. Now, you talk about the deadest period in the world, be Christmas Day to New Year's Day, absolutely nothing happens. It's all fluff and jelly donuts. There is no news. So, and of course, anybody who's in a corporation doesn't want to put news out then too because they know it's going to get lost and nobody will cover it. So now you've got a genuine crisis. And what's more exciting than a tiger out of its cage on Christmas Day, mauls one kid to death and, and, uh, and, and almost devours two others. I mean, it's just it's a great story. So, <laughs> except, for except, for the, except for the poor kid. Um, so, but, but, there's, but there, there's a moral to the story. So, you know, the entire world shows up on the San Francisco uh, Zoo and they, and they talk, oh, we don't know, we're investigating this, this is, you know, blah, blah, blah. Next day, boom, you know, day three, big story. Zoo enclosures too small didn't meet standards of the American Zoological Society. Now everybody's on their doorstep, it's like, oh my God, you know, you, you've killed this poor child and these other two young men, these innocent young men, they, uh, you know, they, one's got, you know, they're permanently scarred, um, you know, and they're still at San Francisco General, they're recovering, and this is terrible, and these guys are getting pummeled. I mean, you know, it's like they're going to throw the, they're going to hang the director of the zoo, Maldonado, the, you know, the, the mayor's on vacation, he's got to come back, you know, the, the entire world's on fire. And this story is, this is like constant on CNN. Every, CNN, oh, all right, so, so all of a sudden it gets to be like New Year's Day. And I, get, I get a phone call. Luckily, I didn't have too much to drink uh, the, you know, the, the night before. And it's from the San Francisco Zoo, and it's like, hey, you know, I don't know if you've been following the story. I said, yeah, man, I've been following that story. Uh, I said, well, we'd love to meet with you. I said, well, I'll be right over. So I said, I get my car, I drive over to the San Francisco Zoo. And they start to tell me a completely different, fascinating story. But it's not, you know, first of all, there are, there, are, there, there, there are no standards in the American Zoological Society. There's guidelines for how big these walls should be. And by the way, you know, it's always the details. People start to, they start to use details against you or they start to tell you these things and they use them as facts that they're absolutely true and real. And the first time somebody makes that thing that's absolutely true and real, you know they're a lying sack of shit. You know it's not true. Almost all the time, they're just not true. Because they're telling you a story and they're pretending to be, like I told you earlier, act confident. Act com they're acting real confident with their facts and it's not true. So always question every single fact. Your own client, um, you know, th that anybody ever gives you because you want to be right. You want to be right. You know, the material and Ross at the San Francisco Chronicle, the two political columnists will tell you, and I always appreciate this, they will say that, that, that you know, our agency is the gold standard for public relations agencies. Because whatever we tell them, you know, we can back it up. We don't just BS them about stuff. So they're telling me all this stuff. So now, now I have the same position with the San Francisco Zoo. I've got to go, I've got to go I, I need to see the, 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 their guidelines that it's not a set standard. Because I want to know I'm right. I want to have that piece of paper too. Um, then they started to tell me, it's like, hey, you know, there's a lot of stuff that was really unusual about this. You know, this, this tiger has been with us a long while. We've never had anything else happen like this. There are claw marks in the cement. Claw, imagine it, cement with claw marks in it. They said something angered that cat so much so that it made her so angry that she left deep indentations in there and got out and wanted to get those three boys. And those three, I keep calling boys, my wife would correct me. Uh, the, one was a, uh, Carlos Souza Jr. who died was 18. The other two fellows, the Dollywall brothers, were um, in their 20s. So they were young men. Anyway, so something that those three guys did really angered that cat. We don't know what it is yet. Um, but they did something. So, and we've got to reopen the zoo and the people are coming down on us. So, by the way, so the zoo's closed. So I said, all right, look, we, so we had to buy some time because we needed more information. So we announced that we were going to have a, we were going to reopen the zoo on whatever day. It was a couple days later. In the meantime, we just blew our brains out trying to put stuff together. We made all these signs. 
up that sort of said, you know, treat the animals as you would treat other human beings. Don't tease or taunt them. Um, and we, re we did a big press conference. And believe, let me tell you something. Everybody in the world showed up at this press conference. Everybody. I've never seen so many people. It's like being, a, it's like being I've been at a White House press conference. It was like being at a White House press conference. Um, except it was outside instead of being in the, the, the briefing room. And, uh, and, you know, we got the head of the zoo to say, you know, we're putting up these signs now and say, please don't taunt or tease the animals, treat them as you would treat each other. And, you know, we're reopening the zoo and we hope people behave themselves. And by the way, you know, the, there are, there, there's not a set standard, there's guidelines, and we met those guidelines, we want to make that clear. And then, of course, this is a total, by the way, this is a total setup, you know, and I want to make it clear. Because I knew, if I were out there and I were a journalist, my first question was going to be, it's like, well, are you saying that they taunted the tiger? I mean, that was the first question. Are you saying they taunted the tiger? No, 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 no. We're not saying they taunted the tiger. But we just want to make sure that, you know, we're still investigating that. So all of a sudden, you know, we intimated what happened without having to say because we didn't have any proof of it at that point. But as we were still continuing, we bought ourselves a lot of time. It's like, you know, could kids have taunted tiger? Okay. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, there's that news cycle. But in the mean, now, in the meantime, you know, it, like everything else in life, you know, as the, the old saying goes, better to, be, better to be lucky than good. We get a little more data. We, you know, we, we, the, the, their car was towed that the Dolly Wall brothers had, had driven this thing. And in it was a half-drinking bottle of Grey Goose vodka. So, and they had been spotted with Carlos uh, Souza Jr. trying to get into, like, the, the Irish Social Club or something. So I was then able to, to, to tell a story of the news media. It's like, hey... You know, these kids were most likely, you know, they were drunk. Um, and they tried to get in a bar. They got turned away. God knows how many other places they went. Here's the happening. So all of a sudden, it's like, you know, we're boys, you know, uh, we're young men, you know, drunk. or you know. So th th that adds to it all. And then, you know, like, it's just, then day three, it's like they found some rocks and other things in the tiger's enclosure that, and sticks so I was able to go out and say, look, we found things that don't belong, would normally be found in Tatiana's cage. Um, and, you know, we, won't, we, you know, we released that. And then to the better, better, better lucky than good. So now I've just laid down, like, some, without having to say it, somebody got taunted. Um, that there may have been liquor involved. That there were things in the enclosure that didn't belong there. And there were these terrible claw marks. Then the better, better lucky than good comes forward. Kevin Fagan, who's a wonderful reporter at San Francisco Chronicle, is able, because he's just a smart guy, he starts calling, 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 calling. He finally finds some uh, lady who was there that day and he said, you know, I saw those uh, three, you know, young men teasing the tiger. And he said, but the ones who really were bad were the Dollywall brothers, the two older guys. And he said, the, the young kid who ended up being killed, um, you know, shrugged his shoulders and got, you know, essentially saying to me, I'm so sorry that this is going to release really, my friends, not me. Now, the irony is, of course, that the Souza Jr. gets killed, not the, not the brothers. Um, and that's like, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, you know, our client is golden. Because everything that we've laid down as pieces of a, of a puzzle that were suspect in this case gets confirmed. Okay, now we know. Somebody saw him, and it's now not us saying it's a good third-party endorsement to this. So then as the story rolls on and on, we completely turn the story on. So we went from the zoo being guilty to these three young men. Um, and as I like to say, I kept saying to all these reporters, I said, and, and, and again, you've got to use your own life experiences when you're telling a story. I said, let me ask you this. It's Christmas Day. Where are you? Where are you on Christmas Day? Thank you. Exactly the right answer. I said, where are you? So I said to all these reporters, and anybody who, anybody, even if you love your, your family, on Christmas Day, you are suffering with your family. So I said, why aren't, why aren't these three guys suffering with their family like everybody else? Why? Because they're high. And it turns out they're smoking dope later on. They're drunk. And they're out teasing a tiger. And they pay a price for it. So I mean, this, then becomes, this becomes the entire narrative for, for the story. And it turns it completely around. Um, and, 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 you know, there's, a, there's an interesting thing about a big crisis like that. There has to be some final moment in it. There has to be a final chapter, something that closes the book that makes the story end. And the thing that, that did that, because we had completely torn their story apart of the, the Dollywall brothers, and they, they also had a very aggressive uh, attorney. Um, oh, God, I can't think of his name. I can't stand him. He's a terrible guy. Um, at a loss. Thank you, Mark Garagos. Thank you, Mark Garagos. Thank you. He's just, he's a really slimy, horrible guy. So, so, so 
The other, so he starts attacking us, starts attacking the zoo. So, you know, get remember, the most important thing, jujitsu the other guy, is you use their background against them. So when Mark Gergos gets hired by the Dollywall brothers, you know, I said, hey, let me tell you something. So I make this clear to the news media. I said, this is the same guy that said Michael Jackson was perfectly normal and that Scott Peterson was an innocent man. Now, I know you all know Michael Jackson. You know he's not perfectly normal. Scott Peterson went to, to prison for life for killing his wife, actually, down in the Berkeley Marina. So when you, you use people's own statements against them, it just it killed Garagos. And it's like, oh my god, and people love that. The news media loves that kind of thing. And you know what? It, it completely defined who Mark Garagos was. So again, you jujitsu people on this on their on their on their own personal madness and their weird statements. But the closer in this crisis was that the father of the deceased young man said, you know. The, I've spoken finally to the two uh, brothers who went out with Carlos, and they said that they may have made fun of the tiger, but they, they didn't think they really teased him. But that was enough to get a headline somewhere that says, you know, father admits, uh, father deceased boy admits. And that, was the end, and that literally was the end of that six week long story. That one story was the capper, and everybody moved on to something else. Except, this is my, 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 my capper for the story, is Associated Press writer called up to kind of write the final wrap-up wrap-up and he says well you know is there is there a lesson to be learned from all of this I said yeah don't get high on weed don't get drunk on liquor don't fuck with man eating animals <laughs> now he changed it to don't mess with man eating animals but you know that's the lesson to this story and um, <laughs> that's my tiger story <laughs> So now, now, can I answer any other questions about uh, about other things? Now, aren't you guys working on a Aren't you guys working on a project stand up to, or is that somebody else who's working on these projects? One group is, but they're all working on all the working project project. again for well, Bay Area legal aid. Right? Well, so, so let me let me tell you one thing about the, that I've learned in all these things. So, you know, w w one is you know the, the basic data is really important. You know, like I said at the beginning of this thing, you got to have really good good lists, good targets, good writing, compelling writing. Don't worry when you come up with, you know, I can't tell you how many, I've worked in a lot of political campaigns, of course, in my life, and your candidates get really worried about, what's our slogan going to be? Oh my God, I got to have a slogan. I got you know, to be, you know, he's tough, he fights, for the, he fights for the little guy. No slogan ever won a campaign. So, and a lot of times clients get ootsy about slogans even though they want one. Don't get thrown off. Don't let people tell you no. Figure out a way around it. Even if it's not exactly what you wanted to do, find something that's close. And I can't remember whether it was Patton or whether it was FDR who said, Imperfect action is preferable to perfect in action. So doing something is a hell of a lot better than doing nothing. Um, at least it gets you closer to whatever you're heading for. Anything else? Um, no, that does it. Any other questions? Yes. Hmm. It's a quick question. Like, when you're talking to journalists, you ever find that they're wary of your story being one-sided since they know you're representing a client or they just Kind of for a story. Like that's a very good question. All, all, all of them are, are and rightly so. They, they should be suspicious of me, and they should be suspicious of the other guys. Um, what I think gives us credibility is I will tell them what I think is correct or truthful about the other person's point of view, but I'll tell them why I why I believe it to be wrong, and I'll try to present the data. But yeah, they're all very, very. They're skeptical of me, and they're skeptical of the other guy. But I think I have a heads up, and and, and people I think our agency have a heads up because. They've anticipated the criticisms of our, our client, and we try to overcome them with facts. But certainly there is, um, there is the, the value of relationships, though, right? right. So, so once you get to know, we're, we always know if there's a PR agency, as from a journalist's point of view, that it's going to be it's slanted. Right. But if it's a PR agency we know and we've worked with, and they've helped us in the past, or they've given, there's a totally different approach that you go with it. You're still critical, but you're less critical. Right. Sometimes you let your guard down because you think you know you get. I know that I know that fellow. He's a good fellow. Yeah, I think. Yeah. You know, but you know what? Her, her point is a really good one, and I think it is a little bit lost on your generation. Um, and, and I, because I know it's lost to my kids, who are my my twin boys are 23 and my 20 now as of this last month, 27 year old. Um, you know, people send out emails all the time and they sort of expect results from them. It'll, it'll, it never replaces the personal picking up the phone or trying to find somebody in person. It really makes a big difference. I've had to beat that into them. Now, now they're actually doing very well in some of the different things they're involved in. But it's like, don't just send out the email. Pick up the phone, talk to them. Go try to find them, meet them, see them in person. Um, because people really, you know, they want to see, you know, your face. They want to know who they're dealing with. And just as a, as a quick, because I, I love data, an aside, um, and I can't remember the exact data, so I, I want to misquote it, but 
you know, when a political campaign or a good cause sends out all those direct mail letters that you get to give money to save the pandas or something, you know, they get, on average, uh, I believe it's a 3%, um, well, I, I will quote it, and even if the data's not right, but I think they get a 3% response. So you have to, to, to get 100,000 pieces of mail go out, you know, only 3,000 people ever, ever write back. When you pick up the phone and you call those people back, you, double, you at least double that response. That's a 100% difference. So that's how important personal contact is. You get a 100% better and maybe more uh, response. Anything else? Yeah, I think that'll All right. do it. Thank do, you. Do you have a question, Chris? Yeah, I yes. was just wondering quickly. So when you, when you come out with like, press releases and stuff, it's really important to, I feel like credibility is established when there's not really emotion, but clearly you have emotion and, and like an opinion. So how do you find that balance between like establishing credibility even though you do have like a credible background, you know. I, you know, I, that's a very good question um, because I am kind of passionate about these things. Um, you know, I try to be a little bit more dispassionate when I'm writing um, than I am when I'm verbally telling a story, but I still try to be really exciting. You know, and I actually right at the moment because people's attention span essentially is you know like a Twitter feed, um, you know, a tweet deck. You know, I'm starting to, and it's like back to the future in this, I'm starting to write headlines on my, sorry about that, I'm starting to write headlines on my press releases that are the old-fashioned decks like they used to be in the New York Times. It's like I got a big one, and I got something else that's like a, a subhead that's a shocker, and then I got, you know, an italicized something that's bold-faced. It's just like, so essentially I have my whole story in three, maybe four headlines, and it's like, wow, that's pretty interesting. But I, I try not, I try not to be, um, when I'm telling these stories and I'm not in front of a class, I'm, I'm, I'm and if you ever see these pictures of me and these things, I, you know, I look like I'm old and grumpy, and I, I'm probably a little bit of both, but when I'm working, I'm a very serious guy, and when I'm able to come lecture in front of people, it's, you know, you get to be a little more uh, upbeat and wild than you can be in real life. You know, it's like you get a lot of different roles to play in life. You know, sometimes you can come dressed and be as comfortable as you all are, and then other times you get you gotta look like you gotta you gotta you gotta do the suit thing because the other guys are expecting the suit. You know? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, so, kind of a more philosophical question: What do you project for like the integrity of the future, of the journalist industry? Because you kind of said with the internet now, anyone can be a journalist. You know, so you don't have to have the same qualifications. You don't have to be held to the same standards it, to be as objective. It's a very good question. It's a, you know what? It's, um, it's both good and bad. Um, I think it's bad because there are a lot of people out there who pass themselves off as kind of being journalists or of being good sources when their data is really bad. But I think it's really good because it does give a lot of people who I don't think, you know, unless your last name was DeYoung, Hearst, or Pulitzer, you know, unless you were born in a newspaper family, the opportunity to be a, a news source. You know, we created the first, uh, some controversy about it, but I, I think it's, it's wrongly placed, the first corporate community news um, site in, in, in history, in my mind, the Richmond Standard for the Chevron Richmond Refinery. And we clearly state it's from Chevron. Um, we've got a special point of view where it says Chevron speaks as their point of view, and the rest of it's all community-based news. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds. You see, it's like, hey, corporations paying for this. This is what, this is their portion of it, and the rest of it's straight community news. And we're getting 50. Actually, this month we get 70,000 eyeballs on it, um, and I think that's more eyeballs than uh, actually the one fellow who's been critical, bless you, critical of this, Michael Iltzik at the LA Times. I think more people read the Richmond Standard than read. Uh, the columnist who was critical of us, and I, I'm very proud of that. Okay, yes, last question. Right, go ahead. Sure. Um, so, like, working in public relations, uh, are your clients mostly uh, like corporations, or do you ever do your work for like, individuals and families? We, you know, we, we, we do our, our, the vast majority of our clients are corporations. Uh, a large number of our clients are government agencies. We work for the city of San Bruno against Pacific Gas and Electric Company and applying pressure uh, on the California Public Utilities Commission to, to find them a significant amount for blowing uh, the city up four years ago. Um, we do some work for individuals. We work for Don Fisher and Doris Fisher, the head of the Gap, when they wanted to create a museum of modern art with their $3 billion uh, contemporary art collection. Um, done work for Warren Hellman, for the Getty family. So they tend to be people of means, but you know we also do a lot of community-based um, work for for smaller folks. And you know, 
you, what you want to do is you want to have somebody come to you with a compelling story, and then you got to figure out you know who else would be interested in it. And sometimes it can just be an individual person who's got a great story, and other times it can be a, a major corporation or or a prominent person. And all of them, just like everybody in this room, have good days and bad days, and and have crises and things will go wrong. And just because something goes wrong or because they do something wrong, unless it's really, really, really horrible, um, all of them are rehabilitatable. Thank you guys very much. Good luck and thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome.